decided to conduct any recounts that might occur in connection with those elections. Um, as of today, we don't have any rates across the county that's within the mandatory range for mandatory recounts, but we do at this point have one candidate who has requested a recount um, at their own expense. Um, the deadline for those requests is actually not until November 30th, so it is possible we could have another candidate um, make a request as well. But it does look like we're likely to have at least one um, scheduled. There are some statutory timelines of when we can conduct that recount. So after this meeting today, I'll touch base with the three of you about basically what your personal schedules look like after Thanksgiving. Um, this is something we'll basically have to be doing um, the first week of December. So at least for one candidate, and possibly more if others come in. So we'll talk about that. Like I said, scheduling is what happens next. Um, that is part of your overall duties, but that happens after the election is actually uh, certified and completed because it's a, it's a recount, it's not part of the original election. Um, so if you want to go next to the next page of your packet, um, top of page three, this is when, oops, my slide, the slide there. Um, this is where we're looking at voter registration and turnout. Um, so here's our first look at different numbers um, from this election. So the voter registration number um, we have a couple different numbers that we have given you. We have total registered voters. Um, if you look in your packet, the um, total registered number um, at the top box includes everyone who is registered, including pre-registered voters. So in Colorado, you can register at 16 or 17. It's considered pre-registration. Um, but it does put you on the roll, so to speak, although you are not mailed a ballot. It sort of activates you at the moment you return eligible, which is when you'll be 18 by an election. So just to give you a sense of the total number we have on the on those ballots, um, on the rolls, we have 461,110 here in Arapahoe County <coughs> as of election day. The second box is all active registered voters. Now the main difference here is this subtracts inactive. Inactive are those folks who um, have possibly moved or done something else that has inactivated their account so that we do not send a mail ballot to them anymore affirmatively, but they are not officially, they haven't withdrawn off our rolls. So sometimes they have moved within the county and just not told us where they've moved to, but because we don't want to be sending mail ballots to bad addresses, uh, we don't affirmatively send one out. They have to come to us to kind of update their address and reactivate it and get a mail ballot or a vote in person. So that number drops down to 427,353. This number does also include some of those pre-registered folks as well. So we did not send a ballot to all of those people, because again, still a few people in there that are not quite eligible. So that's where we have the final one for this election, the number of eligible active registered voters, 18 plus, you were active, we sent you a ballot, or you came in and voted in person. And that is 425,827. So that's where we're at for this election. This is the final number and what we use officially for turnout calculations and things like that. Now, if you were looking at our website on election night or other times when we were giving returns, there were slightly different numbers. That's because our voter registration database obviously changes daily going into the election. And the numbers that are placed on that website just from the Secretary of State's office for comparison purposes are just a snapshot in time chosen a couple days before the election that was placed for. These are the official numbers so, and the official turnout. So that's what's on the slide here. Our official number um, was 425,827. And so our official turnout um, then is 36.93% for this election. Um, given a couple just comparative numbers on the slide here for you for some other coordinated elections recently. In uh, 2019, it was a 42.49% turnout. Um, and then in 2017, it was down at 26%. Um, so we're pretty much in between those two. Uh, one other interesting little fact that to point out is, although our percentage is smaller uh, than 2019, um, we actually have almost 35,000 more active registered voters right now than in 2019. So it's actually only 5,000 less ballots cast than in 2019, even though it looks like a bigger gap. So the number of people voting um, is still much higher um, than 
by and large, with a favorite way of return ballots, 98.83% um, of all voters return their ballot by mail ballot, which means in the U.S. mail or in one of our drop boxes. The vast majority of those were drop box, even though we call them a mail ballot. And only 1.16% actually came in person to a vote center. Um, so, uh, questions just about sort of that voter registration and turnout component. We'll, we'll get into the next chart on page three in the next slide, but I want to open that up to the candidate for a question. It's a choice. You need to take it <laughs> All right. And with that, we'll move on to the middle chart on page three of your report. So this is one of those first important steps of the ten to four duties, which is the reconciliation of ballots. So what you see here in this chart and on the slide, we basically have two systems in elections. Um, we have our tabulation system, which is what actually scans the ballots and counts the votes. And then we have our voter registration system. Every time a ballot is issued to a voter, um, that is tracked, whether that be by mail, or in person. Um, those two systems, um, so ICC is for the tabulators or counts, and then SCORE is the voter registration system. Those two systems are not networked together, they cannot directly ever talk to each other. So this is the one of the ways that Colorado makes sure that we can balance at the end, is we have two independent tracks. Every ballot must go through both systems. So a ballot gets issued in SCORE to a voter, and when it gets returned, it goes to the store again to say your ballot has been returned to give vote credit, is what we call it, to a voter. And then it goes through the physical ballot, goes through the tabulator. So each ballot must go through both places. So if your numbers in one side of the system is different than the other side of the system, that's when you know there might be a problem. And so they're independent systems that cannot talk to each other. So we run a number of reports from both systems and literally compare to paper printouts because they cannot talk to each other directly. And that's what you're here to see in this chart. So um, we've given the, the source of these reports that we pulled. So the first group of numbers here is from that voter registration system, what we call vote credit. Um, so in there we had this number of uh, ballots that were mail ballots accepted, which means received back from ballots from voters in score. We had, which is a 155, 464. We had one provisional ballot accepted back in score, and we'll talk about provisionals a little bit more later. And then we had 1,835 ballots that were in person ballots, people who went into a vote center accepted into score. So according to our statewide voter registration database, we had 157,300 votes. So then when you compare that to what actually went through the tabulators, you'll see the numbers are slightly different, um, which is why we're here today. Um, so the mail ballots is exactly the same, actually, 155464. The in-person ballots you'll see is 1831, so there's four less in-person ballots that were actually run through a scanner. Then there is this category called property owner ballots. Um, we had, um, in this election, a couple of special districts, there was, for example, Parks and Rec District, where under the rules of that district, people who own property in the district but are not registered voters in Arapahoe County, they could live in a different county in the state, are allowed to vote on that measure. They are issued a separate ballot that's just that issue. Um, and so <coughs> those are included here at 239 that came through that system. We track them separately. And so our total ballots here is 157,534. And 
Great question. Okay. So, right. The rejected ballots is actually, we're going to get to that in like the next page or two. Um, but yeah, right now what we want to do is if something is rejected, it never gets to the tabulator. And so it's not part of our balancing, but we will definitely talk about rejection next. So the next chart is where we do this balancing to try to, um, you know, balance those two numbers which we know are off. So um, the, the difference between the two is that we have 234 more ballots that were tabulated than have vote credit in the statewide voter um, system. So why is that? We have the information for you here. Um, 239 of those are property owner ballots. So again, property owner ballots don't go through our statewide voter registration system because they are not registered voters in Arapahoe County. They are standalone ballots. So they are, um, that accounts for some of the difference. And that leaves five. That there are five more um, that have vote credit in our registration system then we're tabulated. And so we did the research and we're presenting that information to you here. Um, we have confirmed by going through the recon daily reconciliation, if you recall, those in-person numbers were off by four. So our daily reconciliation, we have confirmed there are four instances over the course of the eight days where we have individual voters who went through the process of having a ballot issued to them. It was um, issued to them, the label was printed, et cetera. Um, and then they chose not to vote. They were what's called fleeing voters at times, is, is a phrase, um, or loyal. <laughs> um, but basically, that ballot was not tapped. So we did not have the physical ballot to tabulate, even though there was credit in the um, statewide voter registration system. Um, so some of these, um, one of the, for example, one of the people left with their ballot, and at times, they can sometimes then come back and return it. So we don't necessarily void the vote credit at the vote center the second it happens, if they notice it happens right away. Um, because the person could come back 15 minutes later and say, oh my god, I forgot, I, I have this right now. Um, the others are sometimes we just don't see that the person left with it until they do end of the day balancing. And so then they note it in their end of the day records, which is why we have the four times that that happens over the eight days. And so that explains the difference in these four in-person, again, vote credits that were just not tabulated. So we don't have those ballots. They chose not to vote in the end after asking for a ballot. And so that leaves one, because there were five. That takes away four. That leaves one. And so the one is we have, again, from our tracking along the way, we know on the very first day of ballot processing, our bipartisan teams of ballot openers had a batch of 100 that they were going through. Um, and they had 99 ballots at the end and 100 envelopes, and it was their first day, and they could not pinpoint which of those envelopes was the empty envelope. And we did not want to take away vote credit from a voter without knowing which voter it is, because at this point they had been separated and they were anonymous, we could not match them up again. So we knew that there was, put it in our records, that that happened that day as a discrepancy in that day's batch. Um, and so we know that was one mail ballot, um, which was off in the balancing because it was an empty envelope. But we were not able to, what would normally happen is we would know which mail ballot it was. And this happens, you'll see, in, in some other instances after the first day. Um, when you get an empty envelope, you mark it down, and then that envelope goes back, and it becomes a rejection in the, in the system instead. But because we could not identify which of the hundred voters we should do that to, but we weren't going to give it to anybody. So we marked it as a discrepancy and saved it for a presentation to you today. So those are all of the discrepancies. So this is um, basically the end of that sort of balancing part of your duties. And I want to open it up for questions. How do you classify your copper ballots? Do those fall into the numbers that you presented as those under mail ballots? Or how do you? Yes, you will have our considered mail ballots. And we have a little more detail about that in terms of which ones actually came in through the mail versus um, through electronic in a later chart. But technically, because they don't walk into a vote center, anything that doesn't walk into a vote center is a mail ballot. Other questions? Yes. And the way that we track these two, just so you know differently, because as you know, at a vote center, you can vote a paper ballot that looks just like a mail ballot. Is um, we obviously those votes coming in from a vote center are packaged in certain ballot boxes and marked with chain custody that they came from a vote center. And we have one of our tabulators that is programmed and set aside as 
our alleged uh, tabulator 20. Right. We know anything that went on tabulator 20 needs to match all these records from the vote center. It's a keep them as a separate track. Thank you. 
um, and they have eight days after the election. So time-wise, if somebody returned their mail ballot in the middle of October, they would get their notice in the middle of October, they still have till eight days after the election. So it's a rolling process. We don't wait until election day and then tell everybody. It's a rolling process based on when someone did it. Um, so these are the ones, the letters that were sent out. As you can see on um, the numbers, we sent out a total of 1,626 letters or missing signatures, ID through seven out. We got about 27% of those back as actual cures that were validated. Um, so that was able to then, those were then opened and accepted and went through the process. Um, anything that we did not get back um, by law, it now becomes part of what is sent to the district attorney and our post-election submission. Um, under state law, if there was a signature discrepancy and you don't cure it, it gets sent to the DA for investigation afterwards, or to, it, that's just our state law. Um, so if this group that did not cure, that information gets sent over for them to look into. Um, and so um, then we also included here um, the comparison rate for 2019, which is almost exactly the same. So we were at about 27%, 2019 was at 26.69%. So basically the same rate of curing in this election. Um, and we include the methods. So we now are up to four ways that you can cure your ballot. The most popular one in Arapahoe County is a method that now is available statewide but was pioneered in Arapahoe County um, for many years ago um, at this point, uh, which is the text to cure where you can actually cure it on your phone. Um, so 59% of ours were cured that way. So it's definitely the preferred method. How does that work? So the way that the text to cure works is um, you get, like I said, you are sent this letter, and letter actually could be sent by email as well. So physical letter and email if you have the email on file with us. And it tells you in that letter to um, text a word to a certain code. And so you text that word, and it gives you a link to a secure portal. And the portal, you follow the directions where you have to import, you have to input a code, which is like your PIN from the letter, which is your um, voter ID number. You insert that. Um, it brings up your information. It basically has that same affidavit that's on the paper, but it's on your screen. And so you can click check boxes there that yes, I returned this ballot, or no, I did not return this ballot. You sign with your finger, and then it prompts you to pull out an ID and to take a picture of the ID with your phone integrated into the system. And so then it sends us two files through the secure portal to us, the affidavit file and the picture of the ID. Um, the only thing that's interesting about it is sometimes when the picture camera part pops up, people take selfies. <laughs> and so we actually have adjusted our letter to specifically say no selfies, please, um, because that does not count as ID. What kind would that count as an ID? Because I know that under uh, these the voter ID rules in Colorado, it's more than just say a driver's license. It's the same list of IDs that would apply if you walk into a vote center. So it is everything, it's about, I think, 12 to 13 types of ID, everything from a student ID card or a driver's license um, through a birth certificate, passport, um, through other types of government documentation. Um, it's that same list that when you walk into the vote in person. So all of these cures have to be done with the same level of ID as if you were voting in person. And whether you do that by the text cure method or email or mail, you have to provide all the same information. So the people who are emailing us also usually are taking a picture of whatever document they're using as ID and sending that as an attachment to the email as well. Um, so email is second most popular at 27%. So people definitely like to do it electronically. Um, one thing I will notice, um, note is that demographically, these are not just the younger people using it. Like, we definitely know our older voters enjoy the mobile phone interface as well. Um, and then 13% by mail, but we do actually physically mail back the paper. And then if you are one of those people who got the cure early because you voted early, um, you actually have the ability in state law to come into one of our vote centers when they're open and turn in your cure paperwork in person um, if you have it that early. You also, if you have it that early, can put it in one of our drop boxes. Um, that kind of um, is an option. Some people don't get them in time, so they're doing it when after the election during those eight days, in which case they would come into our office if they want to do it in person. 
um, or drop it off, or they would do it you know, by mail or email or, or text it. Yeah. So 2% ended up coming in person, and that's a mix of vote centers and, and the main office. So by and large, people do enjoy the electronic version, which do still require the same level of ID check. Of those ballots that were here, one thing curious data point. Um, what is the partisan political breakdown among um, voters that have the ballot security to select the general Republican, Democrat, or uh, unaffiliated? How did that break down for your ballot? Um, I don't have that information here because we don't run those numbers for nonpartisan elections. That is something we present to candidates for like in um, primaries and even number of years. Um, but I haven't run those numbers for this election. Yeah. So it is available if you wanted to pull, for example, on our website, we have the pure lists and voter lists on our website. Um, so if you wanted to pull that, you could see party affiliation versus cures. Um, but I haven't run those numbers for today. Is that um, in a general election on even number of years, that information that provided or just in the primary? I believe it is required in the primaries. Um, I'd have to double check whether it's required or optional in the general, but I believe we did re provide it in the general as well, whether it was required or optional. But it's not something that I ran for the nonpartisan election. Okay. Mm -hmm. So like I said, it's publicly available information if someone wanted to run that information. I just didn't prepare. Just a point of curiosity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can see, I mean, our voter turnout dashboard that we have on our website right now is broken down with party demographics for overall turnout of unaffiliated Republican and Democrats by day as well as by um, time overall. So that information, like I said, is all public information as well. Any other questions about signature discrepancy and the cure process? All of these, just so I guess one last piece I'll make sure everyone knows, when the cure paperwork comes back, it is reviewed by the same bipartisan teams, our signature verification uh, room supervisors who are a bipartisan team. They're going to review it, make sure the proper ID has been submitted, et cetera, in order for it to be accepted and moved on. Actually, I, I am curious because I know that, um, or I believe some counties have begun to implement an audit of the signature verification process. Is that something that the uh, Arapahoe County Court does or report is would be looking at possibly doing? So we do already have some types of signature verification audit. They are required by rule. Um, there's two different things that we do already. Um, one is any time when we're using the automatic signature um, recognition software, which you don't always run every day, um, there is a check and an audit that is done daily um, by our bipartisan signature verification judge supervisors who audit those ones that were um, looked at by the software compared to human eyes. So they do that audit daily as well as a bigger audit at the very beginning, the first day that we can use it to make sure it's functioning properly before we use it election, and then they do a daily audit of a certain number every day that it is used. Um, so that's one type of audit that we do. Um, the second that we do is there's a general performance audit that's done um, of the signature verification process, um, which is left to the county to determine how to do it. Um, that's a combination of our, um, our nonpartisan, um, or our bipartisan team and our civil service staff, um, who basically look at the actual um, statistics for our like, for our bipartisan judges who do signature verification in the room every day. Um, how many signatures they're looking at per hour, how many approvals versus rejection rates of different teams, etc. And they look for a comparison across teams to see if anything is out of whack with um, compared to other teams, if some particular person or team is rejecting 50% more than other teams, those kind of things. They have some standards and checklists that they go through as a performance type of audit daily of, um, of the way that the room is operating in the various teams. So those are the ones we do under the current rule. I know that all of us in the Coast Association are constantly sharing what different people are trying and people are piloting different types of things. Um, and so we might all be tweaking those processes under the rule right now um, going into the next year, just like we tweak almost all our processes based on what we learn from other counties. Let's move on then to, again, some more specific types of ballots. This is going back to your main packet here on page five. Um, provisional duplicated ballots, these are other things that we need to officially present to you in the um, canvas. Provisional ballots, which if you've been around in elections for a long time, used to be a very big deal. Um, but since Colorado has moved to our model that we have currently, where you can vote at any voting center, you don't get caught up with being at the wrong precinct place, etc., we've dramatically 
so look that, search it, look that, left. So what we do then is we get all of those ballots, 7 p.m. election day, etc., that are in our hands, we go through all of those, then we pull up the provisional. So what happens with these three is once we pulled all those through the system, the three people who weren't sure if we were going to get our ballot in time, we had gotten their ballot in time. And so the provisional ballot was just not opened, set aside as a snowboard justice provisional. So all of these actually did have, that's why it says mail ballot issue slash voted, they had always voted. Um, so. Can you speak to the uh, fact that uh, over time we've had a precipitous decline in provisional ballots because of the nature of the mail ballot system? Does everybody get a, a ballot? There's not, but we used to have much, much more with provisional ballots, right? Right, so yeah, provisional ballots really were people who um, didn't have a ballot or they show up to the wrong location or something like that. And there would be stacks of them, and Kansas boards used to have to go through boxes of them maybe because there was a lot of them and they wanted to understand why were all of these rejected or not taken or whatever. Um, we've done a couple of things in Colorado. One is mailing out a mail ballot to all active voters um, and instituting this cure process. So if you are missing an ID or something, there's this cure process you go into instead of a provisional ballot process. Um, the second thing is by, like I said, going to a vote center model where you can go to any vote center in your county, then you don't get a provisional because you're in the wrong precinct on election day. You can vote. Um, the third thing is actually a more recent change that we just made after the 2016 election, which is um, what I get into next, which is the statewide ballot. So statewide ballots, it used to be, again, um, you can go to any vote center in your county and get your full ballot. Now, what happens if you go to a vote center outside of your county? So I live in Denver. Let's say for some reason I didn't get around to go to my mail ballot, I was really busy, I work in Arapahoe County, it's election day, I don't have time to go to Denver, I go to an Arapahoe County vote center because there's one in the building where I work. <laughs> what happens? Well, I can't vote in Arapahoe County ballot, I can't vote for races in Arapahoe County, I live in, in Denver. So what would happen in 2016, for example, is I would be issued a provisional ballot, perhaps, and it would only be, um, if it was a presidential year, presidential races. Because there's a federal law saying you have to be allowed to vote presidential races. So what we've created, though, is what we call a statewide ballot. So what would happen now if I had done that in this election? So the Rappahoe County would say, well, I can give you a statewide ballot. And the statewide ballot in November included three ballot measures that are everywhere in the state. And so you can vote on the statewide measures. Or you could go to Denver <laughs> and try to get here by seven p.m. So um, instead, for example, last year when there are Senate races and, and um, if there's a year where there's, for example, a governor or other statewide offices, those would all be on the statewide ballot. So instead of issuing provisional to some folks, we end up issuing these statewide ballots. So here in Arapahoe County in this election, um, we issued eight statewide ballots to people from other counties who were in a vote center in Arapahoe County, and they voted on just those three. And then 25 ballots were issued to Arapahoe County voters from other counties. They were in other places. And it was just those three statewide measures. So that also has decreased the use of provisional because there's this other kind of ballot you can get if you're in the wrong county. Um, to vote on at least statewide measures and things. Yes, I'm sorry. That is, oh no, the statewide, I actually don't. That additional info is not required by Canvas, so I put them on the spreadsheet on the um, PowerPoint for you, but um, those are brand new. We just started using the statewide ballots in um, 2020, so it was brand new, um, basically. Um, and those are, are they, they're not counted as provisional? No, they are regular. They are What they are doing is they issue them, and it's just those, it's a special ballot that's just those three. And actually the place, I, you will see some of these when we get to the next page with the duplication ballots, because the ones that come to us would have to be duplicated, because they're on a different piece of paper. Um, but the ones we issue to other people are not in, in any other report. So that was just a point of reference for you. Um, so they are issued, and then they are sent to whatever county that needs to actually count them. Um, and then they get counted that way, but they're only on those measures. Um, the final thing that we've done to then even further decrease the use of um, people being confused or even statewide ballot not countering what they are able um, to vote on is uh, this election, uh, Arapahoe County and Adams County piloted um, is one of the first I think possibly the first uh, co-hosted vote center. So right on Colfax at Martin 
you could come in and get a ballot for the full slate. Um, because a statewide ballot would not cover Aurora City, for example, or Aurora School Board. So this way, at the co-hosted location, no voter would have to be turned away, which had been done before. Um, if they really wanted to vote on those local issues, um, then the statewide ballot doesn't help them. Um, so you're piloting that and working with other counties, especially in the metro area, to see if that's a way to just further be able to serve voters when they'd really rather vote as many things that they're eligible to vote on as possible. So we did um, do that in um, this election, and we ended up having almost an equal number of Adams County and Arapahoe County voters at that vote center overall. Um, so then the next part of this slide is what we were just asking about duplicated ballots. If you flip over to the next page, um, to page six of your packet there, the back page, um, we are required to show you, so 801 ballots were duplicated by our bipartisan team. These are logged text numbers you saw during the RLA, um, how we number the original, we number the duplicate that is made, we keep both, um, and the, we are required to log why they were duplicated. Um, and so the categories of why they were duplicated this year um, include things like machine damage. Um, machine damage is usually something like when the agilis is opening the bottom of the envelope, it accidentally makes the side of the ballot or something in a way that makes it hard to be read by the tabulator. Um, or it could be, um, you know, some damage by machinery um, at the post office, something like that. So we had 354 that were somehow damaged by a machine and we need to duplicate them to be able to make them run through the tabulators. 84 were voter damage. Um, that is basically, it doesn't include pets. I won't just blame the voters. So this includes the one you saw at RLA where he, it was the dog chewed the ballot. That is included. Um, anything that's torn by a voter, spills of coffee, um, sticky substances, things like that from the voter, all go into this category. Uh, 18 were marked in red ink. Um, this is why I have a picture of our ballot opening team. Our bipartisan ballot opener judges are really the ones who have a checklist of things they look for when they are opening ballots. They are the ones that find and pull out sticky ballots, ballots marked with red ink, all of that, so that they can be duplicated and get properly reported. Yeah, I, uh, during the last inaccuracy test, I did a ballot in red ink and I did a ballot in yellow highlighter and then went through the adjudication process and um, those came up literally blank because the highlighter you can pick up by the scanner and the circles were red. Yes. So then the red inside, that, that's why they take it out. Right, so that's why our ballot opener team are definitely like the hardest working teams in show business because they're looking for all this stuff and they're the ones who, like I said, they have to pull out the sticky ballot um, or whatever it may be and they, they put them aside and log it so that those things can get duplicated and be uh, counted you know, the way that the voter intends those ballots to be counted, even though they use red ink. So there were 18 of those. Um, nine signed ballots. Sometimes voters sign their ballot because they think they're supposed to. Sometimes it's that they're initialing by a change or a mark. But because we have a statutory and actually constitutional duty to keep ballots anonymous, uh, we can't run those ballots through the tabulator and create ballot images that have people's signatures and initials on it. So we put those aside, we duplicate them, and the duplicated ones that have no identifying marks are what become the official record. And when you talk duplication for folks who are watching, yes. um, that was like when we in and watch an accuracy test, I had that duplication mode still. When you're entering it into this device that they use if you show up for in-person voting, it's the same, pretty much the same thing, just a duplication mode, so that it, it walks through and does it the way that it's supposed to. Yes, so we take a couple of our ballot marking tablets that are used in the vote centers. We do put them in duplication mode, and it is a bipartisan team who sits 
won the ballot is it was faint enough that the tabulator wasn't picking it up. Um, and that, you know, after reconciliation, at the end of the day, those vote centers send those ballots back to us. And it just so happens it was just a hair too light. Um, and so we had to duplicate um, that one batch that came when, when the toner was low. And obviously then it was fixed and it all went fine, but there was a little bit there at the time when the toner was a little too low that it was too faint to be picked up. I understand that there was an instance for the uh, state party chair of the Republican Party one household that three ballots and I think the uh, instructions that we had dropped and everything was put in those envelopes and then so there was some runover on the ballots including one that filled in that actually got it into, into an oval. Uh, do you know how uh, something like that happens and is that something that sometimes might go into the secrecy of the ballot circumstances that there were a of kind of Yeah, and actually that's the um, exact circumstance that actually was contacted about the day that it happened. So I, I, I talked with them that day um, and we investigated it with our print vendor that day immediately. So what actually happened on that one is in the printing of the ballot itself, um, they were able to, our um, print vendor uh, went through the QC line to go back and identify the batch. And what had happened is as ballots go down a um, conveyor belt, occasionally, and it's very rare, but occasionally they kind of bubble up a little bit and they're lying flat. And this, there were a couple in a row because, again, this household, if you had all been pulled in our very first mail call, uh, they were, were in a row because we, we print them kind of in the way that they're pulled. So they were in a row um, and there was a little bubble up and what had happened is they basically hit the little um, spout that spouts out the ink. And so it touched it as it went by once. So it wasn't that the ink overall wasn't dry on any of it. It was that the ballots themselves accidentally, this, this one little, there was like a little hump, and went boop, and it hit it on its way. And um, so our vendor uh, spent a fair amount of hours that day going back and looking through logs and footage and things to see if there were other ballots that were affected, if this was an isolated incident, what it was. I was able to identify and ensure that it was an isolated incident that only happened at certain and on the line then an adjustment was made, no other ballots were affected across the county. Our recommendation at that time to that person was two things. Um, one, they were free to um, go and get, to get a replacement ballot. At this point, it was fairly early, I believe in October. They could have used not one mail to them if they didn't want to come in person and pick one up or do curbside. Um, so they could get a replacement ballot. That one would be voided, go to fresh ballot. Um, or uh, second, if they did want to vote that ballot, um, they could just use the voter intent marking instructions um, to be able to be clear about what was or was not their intent in the area where there might be some ink discrepancy, and that would probably be taken care of in adjudication, not a full duplication, most likely, because it was a very limited spot on the ballot. It didn't affect the overall ballot. Okay. Thank you. And I don't, I, I don't believe I know which option they chose. <laughs> By the way, speaking since you mentioned adjudication, would you be saying anything about how many ballots went through adjudication? Especially having done a lot of inaccuracy testing, you're very curious about that. Yeah, we do not have, so the number that goes through adjudication before tabulation is not one of those numbers that we normally track in the kind of camp members. Um, it's something that I believe we, we will in the um, official summary report when we get to it. I do have some official numbers for you in terms of undervotes and other things, and we know that those go to adjudication, um, but we don't necessarily um, have as a regular uh, metric the number of every single one that ever gets looked at. You have to go back sort of to the audit log to certain batches or certain things if you wanted to look at a number for a particular problem or a particular issue on a particular day. Well, it is all log. There is an audit log where all of that is tracked, but there isn't a cumulative report that is yeah. sort of a. And I mean, I mean that a cumulative report, but maybe that's because I went through the project and accuracy test that it was very interesting. Yeah, a lot of the things in our um, tabulation system are really based on um, uh, administrative needs of processing batches. So it, it, it's um, you know only certain things once you get to the final tabulation point are things aggregated. Um, but a lot of the processing points along the way are still just sort of batch numbers for tracking, especially if we need to reconcile a problem. If we found something that we needed to do research, um, it's all tracked by batches. So it doesn't necessarily accumulate um, automatically into reports. Mm -hmm. The information exists, but it's not, like I said, put together on its own. So it would take some research. All right. Um, so we are all, so that is um, the end of the official numbers here. The last piece I want to talk about here um, is if you go back to that supplemental report, is the back side of that is just a little more detail about our Yokawa voters. So um, as I 
124th of ballots. Um, they could be issued either by mail, actually mail out to foreign addresses, or um, the electronic is that we send an email with a link to the secure ballot portal. So we do not email ballots, just to be clear. Um, sometimes we, we shorthand talk about email ballots, they're not email ballots. It is a link to a secure portal. Um, so we returned, the turnout was about 10.96%. Um, we returned, had 465 returns um, back. And that was, as you can see, 54%, a little more than 54% were returned through that secure electronic portal. And um, just more than 45.4% were returned by mail. Now, the way these um, ballots work is you can kind of mix and match your uh, method. So even if we send you a mail ballot, if time is getting close and you think it's not going to come back from France in time, you can still return a ballot through the secure portal. Um, so you have your options. So these numbers don't necessarily gel in terms of the same mail out means mail back. They mix and match all the time with its own timing. Anything that is coming through the secure ballot portal must, just like everyone here, be in hand by 7 p.m. on election day. Things that are returned by mail, again, they are allowed to be in the mail by election day. It's kind of a postmark rule, but then it can take up till that cure deadline to get to us from Paris or wherever. Um, so the breakdown is pretty much almost evenly split in this election. I will say, like, for example, last election, last November, when we had a lot more your cover ballots coming in, they were uh, vastly more um, electronic transmission. It, it is a lot more reliable, I think, than international mail for a lot of And it's convenient, they, they feel like they can trust a little bit more than they would get there quickly, if they trust that technology. Well, and to be clear about the secure ballot portal, because some people do ask these questions, it is set up by the state. It is not run by us. It is a statewide portal that is set up under state law. And there are requirements that you submit something back to the state portal. Any of these folks who use that state portal, they, whether it be an emergency ballot on election day or these um, overseas folks, they have to send back um, a signed affidavit um, and some kind of information like that, very similar to um, there is so there is signature verification and such, which is why if you see in your chart um, that there were some uh, 13 ballots rejected and two of them were rejected for signature discrepancy. discrepancy. So there is still an identity check being um, done as well. Um, and then there's 11 received, um, again, after 7 p.m. for people who tried to send them after the deadline. Um, those were all returned back there. Um, just for reference, again, because I've given this before, in the 2019 election, the UOCA turnout was 13%, um, but it was actually less ballots. It was 453 ballots. So higher percentage, but less number. Um, and then the last little report you have, I didn't even make a slide about it because it's mostly zeros, is we do did have one write-in candidate in this election, which is the Inglewood School District. Um, that write-in candidate received zero votes, um, but then we did in that race, because there was a write-in box, um, it does allow the voters to write all sorts of things. Um, now, the way things work in our system is you have to be a qualified write-in candidate in order for it to be tabulated. So, we do know that in adjudication, 108 write-ins were rejected for not a qualified candidate. I cannot tell you, however, how many of those were Mickey Mouse or Mickey Mantle or whatever name you want to call it. I have no idea. We don't track all of that because they're not qualified candidates. Um, so there, there were some rejected write-ins, um, but there were no votes for the write-in candidate. We just make sure that we're going to make sure we have write-ins. Thank you. 
information that's not in the Canvas report, but just a uh, curiosity. We did have, again, continuing our COVID um, created, but now permanent option for curbside appointments applications. Um, these are mail ballots that are handed to someone in the mail ballot packet. They come to the curbside, um, they make a reservation. Um, we have an online system this year where you can make a reservation at a vote center for a certain day and time, Tuesday, 6 p.m. Well, not 6 p.m. we were closed then. Tuesday, 1 p.m. Um, and you pull into that parking spot. The bipartisan election, the judges come out to you. They check your ID just like if you were an in-person voter. And then they hand you a mail ballot packet, basically a to-go packet, um, which some people vote right there in their car and put into the drop box in the parking lot. That's what a lot of the folks do. Um, so we did have 17 people use that service this year. Um, we had almost 200 use it last November when we first pioneered it. The biggest pilot we did this time is we rolled out that online reservation system. Last year you had to call to make a reservation. So this year we were testing an online system in addition to calling. Um, all 17 actually used the online reservation system. So that worked out very well, and we think that that makes it well poised to be able to use next year. We had that group that showed up or a handful that showed up and ended up not actually casting their ballots. Were any of them used to these voters that use the curbside, or did everybody who use curbside end up casting their ballots? You know? uh, no, the curbside we do have a tracking for if there are no shows and things like that. And all of these um, were tracked as full as we could get. Just a, a curious question back to the, the ballot um, types earlier. Mm -hmm. We talked about flat and IPX ballots. Mm -hmm. Of course, you got IPX. How did that break down? How, how many voted using the device versus the flat? Especially since you mentioned how the U of Hava, there's a big, big distinction like making a point of whether they use uh, the electronic versus the mail. I'm curious where people feel confident when they're showing up if, if there's a breakdown on how many are using the flat or the paper form versus the device. So right now that is reports that we can run and so I, we could actually, that's part of the daily balance that you would imagine coming out of a vote center, which you need to make sure all of those balance. Um, in general, we, for this election, we're at um, over two thirds of our voters chose to use the ballot marking devices. Part of that, um, which we know compared to last year, um, is the fact of, um, we didn't really have lines in any of our vote centers this year, um, we had very low in-person turnout. When it came to a big election like last November, um, most people came in and they were like, which line, which way is the fastest? Like, because we have some voting booths that have tablets, some voting booths that are just flat or filling out flat ballots. So a lot of people make a choice based on which one has a shorter line. Um, but this year, um, when that line was taken out of the equation, um, it was just a, probably over two thirds chose to use the ballot marking device. They both create that paper ballot that are then processed the same way, but yeah, just as an interesting note that they have that choice. And also I will note that the accessible options, like the ones that are the audio ballot, as you know from the test, um, to be able to read the ballot out for people who are hearing impaired, or who are visually impaired rather, um, that is on the tablets. Um, that's so, and any people who want those features would pick the tablet as well. And of course for those when you use one of those tablet devices, then you review it, then you put print, so there is still that paper yes. record, which is what ends up getting tested. Yes, so there is a chance to review it on the, your choices on the screen, and then it also prompts you to, to review your printed choices as you walk over, because the voter themselves are the ones who cast that paper into the ballot box, and they are encouraged by both the election judges and the screen instructions to once again check the paper ballot to make sure it's all correct before they put it in that um, bottle box. Exactly. Great. All right, so then the last two things that we need to look at, which are part of your Canvas duties, are these other two reports, which I have given you a printout out of. Um, so this is, the first one we'll look at is the official summary report. It looks like this, I got the first page on the screen. This is basically your Canvas requirement to review the votes cast for each candidate, office, issue, and question. So this report becomes the official abstract and results, which get sent to our GEOs in the cities, our school boards, get sent to the Secretary of State's office, etc. These are the official results. Um, the way we've given this report to you, it includes the, um, at the top, it includes mail ballots versus in-person ballots. And as I said before, it includes under votes, which is when people choose 
that means you have undervoted one vote. So basically, those people choose not to cast. Um, so this is the most comprehensive version of results that includes all of those data points for you by each race. It also includes in here, um, and this will all be again on our website um, later today as well as turning it into all the local and state authorities. For each race, the total number of ballots that were eligible to vote in that race versus the total number of ballots that were actually cast for that race. So it actually gives you a turn up figure for each race as well, if you're curious how many people voted in this one district versus how many people could have voted in that district. So this is really your most comprehensive by the race, by the candidate or ballot measure result sheet. Um, so basically our only requirement here is for you to look at this and then ask me any questions you have that we can talk about if you have any questions on this report. And again, to be clear, all of these turnout numbers here are based on those eligible active voters, so it's above 18, and you're active, and you, you know, could actually receive and cast it out. And this does include the special districts, including those ones that have property on those votes in it as well, too. the number of voters who actually voted in that race turned in a ballot. Um, it, they might have left it blank, but they actually turned in a ballot and this race was on their ballot.
week in Wednesday. Um, and then Thursday is just the last little bit, um, usually. And so that was part of the workflow. We also take into consideration, as we did last year, and we will take into consideration for next year, um, is uh, feedback we get. So last year we got some feedback from some candidates and some parties that they did not like when we gave um, updates with too little of a change. That we were giving updates that only 2,000 votes changed. It was too frequent. It was too little. So we try to juggle all of those things, and um, that would balance those out in terms of as you get farther away from the election, um, how you would get less and less frequent, and how we start stepping down. So it was, a, it was a calculation based on all of those things, and then we were very, um, you know, committed to the idea that we had set a schedule. We had told everybody about it. People were relying on it. We wanted to stick to it. Yes, sure. Yes. So times passed, if you look at the bigger number, so if you look at, it looks like you're on the back, so let's look at the Strasburg Fire District, since you're looking at the back. Um, total 1,451 is the total number of ballots that were out there that had the Strasburg Fire District on the ballot um, as one of their things they could vote on. 564 is the number of people who actually turned in the ballot that had Strasburg on. So it's sort of a turnout for that race, a little mini turnout number for you. So it's not eligible voters in that. It's, it's of those voters who um, uh, who actually sent ballots who were able to vote for Strasburg Fire in that particular race. So only 564 actually sent it. Right. So so it's it's based on right. Not everybody. We have um, you know 399 precincts, and then we have precinct splits because of where city district lines and things are, um, so we have a number of ballot spots. Um, and so uh, not everybody gets everything on their ballot. And so actually this is a good time to then also look at, in comparison to that, the other report that I gave you, um, which is the next report, which is the statements of vote cast by precinct, which is the next one that was in yours, because we work together. So this is just pure numbers, which is what you were just looking at. Number of voters in each precinct and the number of votes cast in that precinct. Um, and so the reason why in the statute we're required to give this to you as a canvas requirement is for you to be able to review the ballots cast and voter registration by precinct um, to be able to see that there are not more ballots cast in any precinct than voters exist in that precinct. So what I've given you here is the 12 page report that goes all the way down to the last page where we get the cumulative, but this is the precinct by precinct list of how many voters and how many voters actually chose to vote in that precinct. You'll see the final three, if you flip to the back, are those special districts that are had property owners. Those, that's why they have little words instead of numbers. So those are the special property owner ballot style. And that's how we break them out to know exactly how we keep track of those coming in. We give them their own special ballot style. They don't get to vote on any else. Zero for registered voters, because they're not registered voters, they're property owners. Exactly, and that's how we're able to track them and be able to do that balance we talked about before. Now this is 12 pages long. This binder which I'm happy to pass down to you guys. This binder then has those first 12 pages, which is the summary, and then it goes through every single one of those races you have on that other form I gave you. And it gives you the same precinct by precinct breakdown of every single race. So this is the full report, which you are, again, as Canvas Board requirements, you are allowed to look at if you'd like to see the really race breakdown version. This is the precinct breakdown version um, of what those numbers are. So that's how those two sets of numbers compare to each other. And to be clear on the undervotes, um, for undervotes, you just, that's just if you have, what, what's the distance? Going back to Strasbourg. Oh. You only have five undervotes, mm -hmm. but you have um, the differential of what, some 60 something percent that didn't cast. They didn't even turn in a ballot at all. Oh, okay. okay. And then the people who did turn in the ballot, five of them left this race blank. So it was total eligible voters. Yes, for, for Strasbourg. Um, so yes, that they may be 
voted on the statewide question, but didn't end up voting on this. So when people refer to things like drop off, they vote for things at the top and don't vote for things at the bottom of the ballot. Things like that. Or the other way around. Either way, this gives you that sort of breakdown race by race. And like I said, this is the official version that we'll be sending to the GDOs because they all like to see their city, their race, etc., and the Secretary of State and things like that. And um, since this is such a thick binder, yes, yeah, that's just <laughs> no. I'm it's the expansion of these numbers right. just by precinct. And but but so nothing throughout is a is it looks like you know every, everything we are the number of times cast is less than the number of registered. Right, so no which is what that summary I gave you is. All of these, if you look at them, are most of them are in the twenty and thirty percent, mm -hmm. which are all matches our turnout overall. There are a couple of precincts that are higher at like forty percent. Um, after you certify the election, after the election is final, we give this data, what you're looking at there, um, to our mapping department. And that binder is what becomes the interactive map on our website, on the wrap-up maps, where you can click on a particular precinct and see the breakdown of votes for any race within that precinct. That's what that binder turns into. And um, that, how far back does that tool go? Right now that goes back, I uh, believe, to 2012 or 2014. So we present it in that format, which we find that it's much more easier for folks to digest. But for anyone who might have some supposed concerns about more people voting and are eligible in a precinct, that tool is available. It's that. all on our website right now. You can look at that for any race, any year, and like I said, those past years going back. And then this will be uploaded in the coming weeks once the work is done. We can't start it until the election is official. Trust me, I know our mapping guys would love to get started on it, uh, but I have to wait until it's official. But it's a great tool. It's very, it's a very useful tool, and I think it's, it's a, um, the graphic display it really helps it instead of tables of numbers. <laughs> so you can see right now, even on our turnout map this year, we added that graph for the first time on the turnout map um, on our website right now for this election, um, where you can see by degrees of how dark a color each part of each precinct is, that every day during this election, you could see where votes were coming in from and where they were not coming in. Mm -hmm. So we added a live version of that for the first time this election, and we're going to keep that there. about sort of these totals or the official totals in any of these? It's a lot of data. <laughs> I just want to look at my precinct. So if we don't have any other questions, so then that is the presentation of all the information um, and all of the steps in terms of the Kansas Board of Duties that we walked through at the beginning. Um, what's left now is basically the certification of the election, which is what makes it final and official. Um, the certification is a form that is um, required in state law and by the Secretary of State's office. I went ahead and put the language in it on the screen, but I'm going to pass around one form for, for there's places for all three of you to sign. Um, but just to reiterate, so everyone knows what it says, and before I pass it around, it says that we, the underside Kansas Board, do certify that we reviewed the post-election RLA, we reviewed all ballot forms and ballot laws associated with this election, which we've walked through, we've compared the number of ballots counted to the number of ballots cast, and we reviewed and here do certify the results in the official abstract of votes cast, which is that document we were just talking about here. And so basically the signed certification in that document with all these under votes and over votes are the two documents that are the official ones that get sent out to everybody there. Um, so this is basically the last step um, in the process. I have a, like I said, a paper copy with that language on it um, that has each of your names on a, on a uh, line here, and then um, one of these Arapahoe County seals that I will put on it at the end, which of course makes it look even more official. <laughs> and uh, that. Um, that is basically the end, the end of our process. Um, so 
Walter. We appreciate anyone who's watching this video. If you've been um, with us this whole time, either live or watching the video later, um, this is an important part of our process, and we uh, thank you for wanting to learn more um, and follow along. And like I said, all of these documents that we talked about here, the Canvas report that has these charts that were part of the PowerPoint, um, and the official certification and official summary report abstract will all be put up on our website, um, hopefully by the end of the day today, once we get it out to the official authorities of the state and other localities. So those are public documents you'll be able to see. Just like all of the documents and the video of the Kansas board meeting from the 2020 election are on arapahovotes.com on our election transparency page. So all of this will be up there as well, and you can move backwards um, to see information from prior elections as well. Um, so I'm going to take this. We're going to go yeah. echo to everybody. Thank you for joining us, and also thank you for being a part of this campus board. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for the detail, too. It's really good information. Sure. So I'm putting a sticker around right here. Um, the 2021 coordinated election for Arapahoe County is uh, certified and final. Again, thank you everybody who is here and everybody online. Um, and we will uh, make that a wrap for this year.